very brief introduction. Okay, very perfect. Brief. All right. Okay. Okay, we're live. Excellent. Welcome back, everybody. So this is going to be now our first um, lecture of the day, day two of May 2020. Um, and I'm really excited and very happy and honored, honored that we have um, Dr. Anil Seth with us today uh, for this opening lecture. So um, Dr. Anil Seth is a professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex. And he's the co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness uh, Science. His research investigates the biological basis of consciousness by bringing together research across neuroscience, mathematics, artificial intelligence, computer science, psychology, mm -hmm. philosophy, and psychiatry, just that. Um, so Anil is editor-in-chief also of the journal Neuroscience of Consciousness, um, Oxford University Press. He's a fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, also known as CIFAR, uh, and he's a Wellcome Trust uh, Engagement Fellow. And aside from his research work, Anil Seth is also a writer and a public engagement special, specialist in consciousness science, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence. Um, so we are really, really happy, excited, and grateful that Anil accepted this invitation. Uh, we've been wanting to have him with us for a long time, so finally it is happening. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to uh, give the floor to uh, Anil Seth. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Anil Seth. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kareem. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, and I will just carry on, assuming that's the case. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I got the invitation. I sort of was assuming this was a small lab meeting rather than a massive one and a half thousand people conference, but there we go. So I'm very honored to be here and to share this session with some brilliant researchers, and I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. So, but to stave off the angry panda, I'll, I'll get straight into it. I decided to call this talk The Strength of Weak Artificial Consciousness. And I hope the reason for that uh, will become clear as I go through the talk. But I think I'll give you a, a flavor of it now. It's just, in, in my view, rather than trying to build a conscious machine, if that's what anyone's trying to do, I think there's great value in using AI and machine learning to shed light on the biological basis of consciousness. And we can also use insights into the biological basis of consciousness to help develop better AI and machine learning. I want to start with this movie. This is Ex Machina by Alex Garland. I, I hope most of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, you should really see it. Ava, the, the robot here, is not made of neurons. She's made of, of some stuff, some structured gel inside her brain and, and bits of metal and so on. She's a robot. And the film Ex Machina is all about deciding whether this robot Ava is conscious. And what I want to think about in this talk are a set of questions that are brought up by this movie and about this area in general. How should we think about Ava? How should we think about the possibility of a conscious robot? What would it take to build a conscious machine? And what is the relationship between consciousness and intelligence? Is AI on an inevitable path to artificial consciousness? So the outline of the talk, this is a session, Consciousness in Brains and Machines. So I'll first talk about consciousness, then consciousness in brains, then consciousness in machines. That's the outline. Right, definitions. It's very easy to get stuck in definitions of consciousness. Uh, I don't want to get stuck there. So I'm going to go back to what I think is kind of a common sense uh, definition, which is due originally to Thomas Nagel, a famous philosopher, what it is like to be a bat. And he says, for a conscious creature, there is something it is like to be that creature. There's something it is like to be me. There's something it is like to be you. There's something it's like to be a monkey or a whale, probably a, uh, I don't know, a parrot. But there's nothing it is like to be a phone or a table. For a conscious creature, there is something happening. There is some conscious experience of some kind going on. That's all it takes. Consciousness is not the same thing as self-consciousness. You can have conscious experiences with a, 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 without being aware that you are an individual that is having them. That's a kind of higher level construct. To give the game away, consciousness is not the same thing as intelligence. At least certainly that's what, what I think. And I think this is probably fairly obvious, but just so long, just to make sure you know where I'm coming from, consciousness does not depend on language. We don't have to be linguistically enabled in order to have conscious experiences. Now, in trying to understand the role of consciousness, the place of consciousness in our universe, 
we often end up, or I often end up going back to the words of the philosopher David Chalmers, who is sort of the, the modern version in some ways of Rene Descartes about putting this problem of how to explain consciousness very clearly. He popularized and coined the term the hard problem of consciousness. And here's how he describes it. It is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. That's the hard problem of consciousness. Why should any kind of physical processing, whatever, whether it's in a brain or a machine or in a dishwasher, give rise to and be identical with or underpin uh, a conscious experience. And Chalmers distinguishes the hard problem from what he calls the easy problem or the easy problems. Now, these are problems which are very, very difficult, but these are problems for which there is no conceptual mystery about how a mechanism could in principle solve them. This is basically how the brain works as a physical system, how it transforms sensory inputs into outputs, how it performs the various myriad sophisticated functions that it performs. These can be include language, this can include how perception works, how behavior is generated. The point is that although these problems are insanely difficult, there's no mystery that some mechanism could give rise to the, the solutions to these easy problems. The hard problem, again, is the problem of why and how any of this should be associated with conscious experience. Now, in my view, uh, just sort of sweeping consciousness under the carpet through the easy problem is not a great idea. And trying to tackle it head on, trying to head on solve the hard problem is also kind of doomed to failure. It's more of a metaphysical problem than a scientific problem. So with tongue in cheek, I, I take my approach to be the real problem of consciousness. Now there's many other people who've said similar ideas, but the idea here is to accept that consciousness exists and then try to account for its properties um, in terms of things happening in brains and bodies. So I put it like this. How can mechanisms and processes in the brain and the body explain, predict, and control properties of consciousness, whether they're functional or phenomenological? And by phenomenological here, it's a bit of a mouthful. What I mean is the, the redness of red, the paininess of pain, you know, the, the properties of experience rather than the functional or behavioral properties that go along with that experience. Those are the real targets that a science of consciousness should be um, aiming to account for. So that's the, the real problem of consciousness. Other people have called it things like neurophenomenology. Chalmers himself called it the mapping problem. One way to think about addressing this problem is to go from neural correlates of consciousness to what we might call explanatory correlates of consciousness. Now an NCC is, you know, kind of the gold standard methodology in the science of consciousness has been since Francis Crick and uh, Christoph Koch defined the term 30 years ago. An NCC is the minimal neuronal mechanisms jointly sufficient for any one conscious percept. In this picture, the NCC is the NCC of the perception of a dog. But of course, correlations are not causations and they're not explanations either. So to help account for properties of consciousness, we need to do more. We need to start thinking about and describing and identifying neural mechanisms that go beyond correlation to explain and predict and control phenomenological properties. And one way of cashing this idea out is an idea I'm very partial to, which is to think of the brain as a prediction machine. Perception, action, attention, all the things the brain does can be thought of as special specializations of a general process of brain-based prediction. Let's think about perception to start with. Imagine being a brain. For a second, just imagine you are a brain. You're stuck inside this bony vault of a skull and you're trying to figure out what's out there in the world. That's to a first approximation what perception is trying to do, what's out there around us. But sensory signals that come in through our eyes and our ears and our other senses, they don't come with labels about what they're from. They don't really come with labels about whether they're from, whether they're visual signals or auditory signals or whatever. It's just uh, sensory signals that are transduced into electrical impulses. So perception has to be already, you can see a kind of process of inference. The brain has to make its best guess about what's out there on the basis of what are inherently noisy and ambiguous sensory signals. And that's the sort of perception from the brain's view. And formally, of course, this amounts to uh, a process of Bayesian reasoning or Bayesian inference. This is Thomas Bayes who 
famous for introducing, he didn't do the maths, he sort of formalized this way of thinking. And Bayesian reasoning is how to optimally combine new information with existing prior beliefs in order to come up with these best guesses, these posterior uh, beliefs about, um, about what's going on. And the first person to sort of put this, apply this to the problem of perception probably was Hermann von Helmholtz, who, who thought about perception as a process of unconscious inference. That is, the brain is continually making its best guess about what's out there, and it's taking into account new data, uh, which is the likelihood here, sensory data, to update, to optimally update this best guess of what's out there, to reach new, continually reach new posterior best guesses about the causes of sensory signals. And that's what we perceive. We perceive the brain's best guess of the cause of the sensory signals uh, that it receives. Now, these days, we tend to think in terms of the framework of predictive processing, predictive coding, active inference. These are all relatively interchangeable terms for what's, what's really a process theory, a process theory being a mechanism that could be implemented and you know, constitutes a hypothesis for what the brain is actually doing when it's inferring the causes of sensory signals. Now, in this diagram, it's a bit messy, but the, the key point is that in predictive processing, um, you have counterflowing top-down and bottom-up signals. So you have the blue arrows, which are top-down or inside-out predictions, which are conveying the brain's predictions about the causes of sensory signals, in this case, in a sort of hierarchical manner. And then the bottom-up signals, the prediction errors, simply report the difference between what the brain expects and what it gets at every level of processing. Uh, and the idea is that by minimizing prediction errors everywhere and all the time, the brain is actually implementing an approximation to Bayesian inference on the causes of sensory signals. It's a way for the brain to, to do uh, Bayesian inference. And there's other sort of bells and whistles one can attach to this kind of process that, for instance, at the bottom you can see um, curves of different precisional variants. This corresponds to the idea that uh, that there can be a, a control of the balance between prediction errors and predictions. Uh, if prediction errors are expected to have high precision, then they can have more effect in updating perceptual best guesses. And this corresponds uh, to the process of paying attention. When we're paying attention to something, we're increasing the signal to noise ratio on sensory signals, we're increasing their expected precision, we're increasing their influence on updating Bayesian uh, beliefs. So that's some idea of what might be happening in the brain. Of course, there's a long tradition for this. It goes back to Helmholtz, as I've said, but in theories of perception, probably best to, uh, to Immanuel Kant, who always thought of perception as, as never having direct access to what reality actually is, but that's always hidden behind a sensory veil. And all we can do is make our best guess about what's behind that sensory veil. And that's what the world of our perceptual experience consists in. Now, from the point of view of trying to understand properties of consciousness, there's a key claim in this way of looking at, at the brain, which is that perceptual content, what we perceive, is not conveyed by the sensory signals them themselves, but is rather conveyed by these top-down predictions that constitute the brain's best guesses about what's going on at every moment. And the bottom-up sensory signals just convey these prediction errors. Now that's again to a first approximation. So we can start to understand different kinds of experience in terms of different kinds of prediction now, not just in different kinds of brain region or different kinds of synchronous activity or something like that, but in different kinds of, of Bayesian prediction. I think it's more powerful language. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, predictive processing is not a theory of consciousness. It's a very general theory of how brains do what they do. But I actually think this is an advantage for consciousness science, not a disadvantage. And there's a couple of papers written with the philosopher, a colleague of mine, Jakob Hoppe, where we argue that predictive processing is not a theory of consciousness, which is why it's a terrific theory for consciousness science, because you can use it to build bridges in this real problem style between mechanism and phenomenology. So let me give you some examples. And these examples are what I call computational neurophenomenology, how to use computational models of the sort we might get in AI and machine learning to build these sorts of explanatory bridges. And the specific examples I'll give, there are three of them, they all have to do with how uh, we might have unusual perceptual experiences when we see patterns in things uh, that 
emphasize how the structure of our perceptual experience depends on the brain's expectations being projected into our sensory environments. And we're all familiar with this when we see faces in clouds, for instance. And there's a specific word for this, the, the Greek word paridolia. Uh, but we can get a, a more mechanistic handle on this by thinking about some approaches from machine learning. This is a very standard feed-forward convolutional neural network, something like AlexNet, um, which has been trained to be very good at classifying images and identifying objects with images. Information flows in this network in a purely bottom-up feed-forward direction. But what you can do, and what was done first at Google Deep Dream, was to run it sort of top to, uh, upside down, back to front, inside out, however you want to say it. But you, instead of um, feeding the input from the image to the top level, you fix the top level and you update the image until the network settles into a steady state. And of course, when you do this, you get these amazing images uh, that, be, that became quite well known across the internet, these sort of weirdly psychedelic images um, through this Google Deep Dream. And at Sussex a few years ago, we took this a little further with uh, my uh, postdoc, Keske Suzuki, and we took a panoramic video of Sussex campus and then we processed every frame through a version and adaptation of this deep dream algorithm and did various things for continuity and so on so that people could put a VR headset on and have this very strange experience of Sussex campus. And the point I want to make here is that it's fun. The other point I want to make here is that this is not just photoshopping dogs onto people's uh, bodies. These dog faces are sort of organically emerging out of the scene. And it is quite similar phenomenologically to the sorts of experiences people report in things like the psychedelic state. So what we have here is a first way of thinking about how we can use computational models to understand the phenomenology of a particular kind of perception, what psychedelic experiences are to, you know, to at least some approximation, what they're like. And what we're doing now is taking this, uh, this work further. This is still with Kesuke Suzuki and David Schwartzman. And we're now looking at, instead of just having a single feed-forward uh, network that we run backwards, we couple uh, a feed-forward, a deep network, which we can run forwards or backwards, with a generative network. And we can parameterize these, these coupled networks in, in various ways. I, oh, I forgot a reference here. This was from a originally a paper by Nguyen et al., which I wanted to cite. Um, apologies for that. But we can adapt that work and parameterize these coupled networks in, in different ways to simulate different kinds of altered uh, perceptual experience. So for instance, by fixing a, a top level of the convolutional net, we can simulate things like neurological uh, complex hallucinations. So each of these image patches on the right, uh, each image in the leftmost column is the sort of original image, and then we go towards the right, we, we go through various iterations of the network, and at the end, we see the image we end up with, which is sort of some you know, in this case, a, a complex hallucinatory version of the sensory input. So we see pretty well-formed objects, but they are weird. Uh, we can simulate other kinds of perceptual hallucination. This is what happens in visual loss, things like Charles Bonnet syndrome, where people start hallucinating after they have uh, lost early stages of, of visual processing, for instance, in macular degeneration. The character of the experience is different in a way that we can try and get a handle on through this uh, mechanism here. Similarly, this is a bit like the psychedelic uh, phenomenology I just described, and we can also simulate simple psychedelic, psychedelic experiences that have a much more geometric um, character. The point of all this is that we can use these sort of machine learning models to get a handle on what specifically is underlying different kinds of conscious experience. A uh, couple of other Quick examples of this, this is work with uh, my PhD student, Alec Chance and Chris Buckley. And here we're looking at what we're calling hybrid predictive coding, where predictions flow both in top down and bottom up directions, implementing different kinds of inference. So the top down predictions are the sort of classical iterative inference where they step by step improve perceptual best guesses. Bottom up predictions implement this thing we call it, that has been called amortized inference, where they fast learned mappings between sensory data and posterior uh, beliefs. And our idea here is that these different directions may correspond to different kinds of perceptual phenomenology, perhaps gist perception for amortized bottom-up predictions, detailed perception for other kinds of for the iterative uh, inference. The last example very quickly is how uh, learning and using in, and how thinking about reinforcement learning can help us understand systematic misperception of our environment. 
So in this simple uh, study, again, uh, led by Alec Chance, we simulated a simple uh, bacterium which is inhabiting a world and it's trying to survive in that world. And it does so by minimizing a quantity called expected free energy. And you can just think of this as the sort of expected future prediction error in a predictive processing sense. And what we find is agents that do this, firstly, they learn very quickly, which is nice. It's the, in the middle uh, graph, it's the, the red line, it's lower, it's learning more quickly. But interestingly, the uh, perceptual model that it learns is systematically inaccurate. So it picks up, it, it learns to perceive the world in a way that's useful for it, not in a way that is maximally accurate. So this is a way of using thing, uh, using sort of a mixture of generative modeling and reinforcement learning to understand how our perceptual experience may systematically depart from accurate veridical representations of the way the world is. So those are three examples of this idea of kind of computational phenomenology. Now, the next step is to show that this doesn't just apply to the world, it applies to the self too. So our experience of the uh, self is also a kind of perception. It's also a kind of best guess or controlled hallucination. And it's generated in the same way that our experiences of the world are generated through updating perceptual predictions based on sensory data. I'll just get to the sort of heart of the matter here and talk about one way of perceiving the body, which is the body from the inside. This is called interoception. We perceive the body um, in terms of sensory signals coming from the internal organs like the, the heart, the lungs, uh, the gut. And collectively, these sorts of sensory signals and their interpretation by the brain, that's called interoception or interoceptive uh, processing. And it's very important in keeping us alive, although we don't tend to think about it all that much. Now, from the brain's perspective, interpreting the causes of interoceptive sensory signals is just as complicated a problem as in interpreting the causes of external or extraceptive sensory signals. So we can think of a process of interoceptive predictive coding or interoceptive inferences where we, the brain is testing its predictions about the causes of interoceptive signals and updating them with interoceptive prediction error. Uh, so we have exactly the same process, but now going on purely inside uh, the body. But there's something particularly interesting about interoceptive inference, and this is now just sort of more theoretical rather than experimental, but it's that interoceptive inference exemplifies active inference. And what that means is here prediction errors are minimized not so much by updating predictions, as we might do if we're passively looking out at a visual scene, but by making actions to change the sensory data. That's another way of reducing prediction errors. So you change the data until you get what you expect. And that's important because interoceptive predictions are not geared towards what, finding out what's there. They are instrumental, control-oriented, rather than epistemic or discovery-oriented. We uh, perceive ourselves internally in order to figure out and regulate the internal state of the body. Put simply, interoceptive predictions are about controlling things rather than finding things out. And this has some super interesting historical connections here. Very early work in, in probably what would be now called AI, but was then cybernetics, say that every good regulator of a system is a model of that system or must be a model of that system. Uh, this is uh, Conant, Roger Conant and Ross Ashby in 1970, 50 years ago. And what they're getting at here is that if you think of the brain as a regulator, fundamentally a regulator of the body, that implies the need for predictive models of the body that are able to implement regulation. And that's what interoceptive active inference is all about. It's about predictive regulation of what we might call physiological essential variables. Perception of the body is intrinsically tied to the ability of the brain to keep the body alive. And this has consequences for the kind of experience that these different predictions support. So visual predictions underpin visual perceptual experience, which is to a first approximation, figuring out what's there. It's not always like that, but for now it is. Whereas interoceptive predictions underpin embodied experience, like what's going on in my body? Am I, am I gonna stay alive for the next hour? Um, am I hungry, thirsty? You know, am I afraid? All these sorts of embodied experiences have more directly to do with the uh, with the way in which, oh, what's happened? Uh, with the uh, prospects for the body to stay alive. And this means that all perceptual experience has very deep roots. Staying alive, which is I, arguably what brains are for most fundamentally, 
Staying alive entails this form of control-oriented predictive regulation of physiological essential variables. We perceive ourselves in order to control ourselves in order to stay alive. So the deepest levels of the experience of being an embodied self, of embodied self, would rest on these control-oriented interceptive predictions. And my claim, and it's just a claim, is that all the rest follows. All our perceptual experience, whatever it is, is grounded in this basic biological imperative to stay alive. We perceive the world around us and ourselves within it with, through, and because of our living bodies. And there's a fascinating kind of inversion here from you know, old ideas of, of Descartes. So back to Descartes again, who first distinguished between matter stuff and mind stuff. Descartes was also keen to distinguish humans from other animals in terms of their possession, human possession of rational minds and the, and the kind of consciousness worth having. He didn't deny that animals were, were conscious, but they, they lacked the kind of rational conscious mind that, that humans did. And so to, do, to make this distinction, he thought that the flesh and blood nature of, of animals was not relevant to uh, the conscious, their, any conscious status they might have. Without minds to direct their bodily movements, animals must be regarded as unthinking, unfeeling machines that move like clockwork. Now, I think completely the opposite, that conscious selfhood and consciousness in general emerges because of and not in spite of our beast machine nature. So consciousness is very closely tied to life, the way I think of it, and less closely tied to intelligence. Now, that's sort of my view, very rapid view on how to think about consciousness from a biological perspective. But in the last few minutes, I want to return to machine consciousness. And what does this perspective have to say about the prospect of uh, conscious machines? And let's go back to Ava in Ex Machina. And the question is, how should we think about Ava? What would it take to build a conscious machine? And what is the relationship between consciousness and intelligence? So here, I want to probe this intuition that I'm sure not all of you share, but it comes up quite often, which is that artificial intelligence, as it is now, is on a trajectory uh, towards artificial consciousness, whether it's in a, whether it's a sort of inevitable or whether it would be some just strategic uh, development of the strategy and the methods and the tools that we already have. Maybe there's some threshold uh, at which AI will suddenly become aware and you know, after which we probably all die in some science fiction catastrophe. But there's this sort of idea of artificial intelligence leading to artificial consciousness. Why do people think this? What's appealing about this notion? I think it's based on three intuitions, all of which are questionable, if not wrong. The first is functionalism. This is an idea in philosophy of mind, basically says what makes something a conscious mental state or a mental state of any kind is not what it's made out of, but what it does, what role it plays for and in the system. And there are two parts of this. There's substrate independence. It doesn't matter what a system is made out of, whether it's silicon or meat. And there's the sufficiency of input-output relations. It doesn't matter kind of what the internal structure is like, even you know, as well as what it's made out of. What matters is how it transforms inputs into outputs. Now, I think both of these are tempting, but neither is obvious or justifiable. Um, and it's to say I'm slightly agnostic, but suspicious of both of these intuitions. I can't see a good reason why consciousness should be substrate independence, but also no good reason why it should not be. And the same goes for the sufficiency of input-output relations. Brief aside here, for those of you who know about integrated information theory, Giulio Tunoni's brilliantly creative set of ideas, uh, this accepts the first, but not the second of these points. For IIT, a system can be conscious when it's made out of, no matter what it's made out of substrate independence holds but sufficiency of input output relations doesn't hold it has to have the right kind of internal structure on iit a simple feed forward network however complicated the input output function is not conscious but what about brains well you know, part of the reason we find functionism appealing is because of this idea that we have a software hardware distinction and it doesn't matter what the hardware is so long as it's the right software but this isn't the same as a kind of wetware mindware. There's no clear line to draw between the implementation and the dynamics. Every, act, every time a neuron fires, the structure of the brain changes a little bit. Dynamics and structure intertwined closely at all levels in the brain. And where to draw a line at which the substrate does not matter from the view I've been promoting that 
um, the brain is fundam fundamentally about regulation. Well, regulation goes all the way down, even down to single cells. Hard to know where to draw the line. And there's, of course, a, a long tradition of ideas here about continuity between uh, mind and life, between life and mind. And here we're just sort of extending that to consciousness a bit. And the second question is, why should the input-output functions that matter be those associated with intelligence? That's also driving this association of AI with artificial consciousness or with consciousness. And here I think there's a couple of other intuitions that deserve to be pressed a bit. And you know, I think one of them is this anthropocentrism where we as humans think we're super special and we're at the center of every center of everything and the top of every pyramid. And we think we're intelligent and we know we're conscious. So we associate the two and we sort of project consciousness out into other things to the extent that they match up to our very questionable human standards of cognitive competence. But we know that we're not that special when it comes to our place in the, the bush of life. We're just one twig on this infinitely delicate evolutionary tree or evolutionary bush. And finally, there's this, this, this I think, quite, for me, somewhat amusing, but, but you know, not completely, idea of the technological singularity, this idea that AI is, at, is increasing at such an exponential pace um, and we might happen to be right on some important cusp at which AI is going to bootstrap itself beyond our control and our understanding. And perhaps after that point, that's when consciousness sort of happens. Um, now, this is a sort of quite a, a, a science fiction-y thing to think. And it's, it's, it's interesting. It's certainly not completely off the rails. But as we all know from COVID-19 this year, the problem with exponential curves is no matter where you are on them, what's ahead of you looks impossibly steep and what's behind you looks irrelevantly flat. So it's very difficult to know where you are and also just difficult to consider that why should consciousness be at this particular uh, point at which we tend to locate ourselves. So my way of thinking is that intelligence, and I'm almost done now before the panda comes, intelligence is not necessary for consciousness. Um, you can be conscious without being smart. Probably lots of animals have the capacity to feel pain without being intelligent in a, certainly not in a general human way. They might be intelligent in their domain specific way. I would also argue that intelligence is not sufficient for consciousness. We can build systems that display intelligent behavior without them needing to be conscious at all, without consciousness coming along for the ride. Um, and you know, we just, we don't have to have it. So consciousness and intelligence are doubly dissociable. This is a, a fairly weird diagram just to show that consciousness and intelligence, different axes, each of those axes is itself multi-dimensional. Multi so octopuses could be conscious and intelligent in very different ways from, uh, uh, from artificial systems and from humans. So this is just to finish very briefly now. How do we think about consciousness in life? Well. Here's some questions we are now well placed to answer. Can we understand biological consciousness without understanding its roots in physiological regulation in life? I don't think we can. I think we need to understand how the predictive mechanisms that underpin our experience, how they developed, evolved, and operate in moment to moment in terms of keeping the body alive in order to understand how brains give rise to consciousness. Is everything that is alive conscious? Probably not. The life is just as intelligence is not sort of sufficient for consciousness, neither is life itself. And it's everything that is conscious alive. This is perhaps a more interesting open uh, question. Is life necessary for consciousness? Um, we'll leave that as, a, as something to perhaps discuss. Even if we could build artificial consciousness, should we? Even if that took building a living machine rather than just uh, a more intelligent computer, well, as people like the philosopher Thomas Metzinger have said very convincingly, the project of even attempting to build a conscious machine is ethically very problematic. Even if it's a very low probability of success, the possibility of introducing uncontrolled new forms of suffering, which we might not even identify as such, is would be an ethical catastrophe. So we need to think about these low probability events in advance. And as science fiction tells us, it will also doom us all to catastrophe. And as another aside, final aside, we should perhaps worry more about things like brain organoids, which uh, are these brain-like structures grown in a lab. Now, these are not smart, 
but they are made of neurons. They are made of the same stuff that real brains are made out of. And as they get more elaborate, it's not unreasonable to wonder whether there could be some minimal forms of sentience uh, arising in these lab-grown brain-like organoids. So this is my last slide. And the strength, I want to return to the measure, the strength of weak artificial consciousness. So I don't think we should be you setting an agenda. Have one minute left. Ah, good. Thank you. Uh, we don't want to build a conscious machine. We should use AI, ML to build explanations linking mechanism to phenomenology in this sort of real problem style. This is a sort of what I call computational neurophenomenology. We can do this both for experiences of the world and experiences of the self, different kinds of predictions, different kinds of experience. The other way in which I haven't talked about uh, in this talk is we can equip AI with some of the functions of consciousness. Current deep learning systems are probably more closely associated with unconscious processes in the brain rather than conscious processes. So by understanding how brains do what they do in virtue of being conscious, we can perhaps equip AI with things like perceptual integration, generalization, broadcast among different modules, error monitoring, and so on. So in conclusion, there are many, many exciting opportunities to not build conscious machines. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And yes, I have a, a book coming out uh, next year. I think it's now definitely set for September, um, where I talk about all this in <laughs> a lot more. Thank you and look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Anil. That was fantastic. Um, it was really amazing. And we have many questions. Uh, we won't be able to get through all of them. Uh, but the good news is we do have a panel discussion later, so we'll come back to some of the themes. Um, so what I'll do is I'm pulling up the uh, ask a question. Uh, you might be able to see some of them if you stop sharing your screen. OK, so stop sharing screen. How do I do? I'm going to just stop that. Right, yeah, good. That's, yeah, that's perfect. So um, there's, the, uh, there's the question out there. I'm going to start by what the first question by Paul Chizek. I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, so, so Paul is asking, um, the machine learning work produces the images of dreamlike states, as you have shown, but how does it adre really address the subjective experience like qualia um, or dreamlike states any more than um, image processing addresses the subjective experience of normal vision, so to speak? Good question. Hi, Paul. Um, it's good to hear from you. I've been much inspired by your work over the years. Well, I, I, think, I think you're probably, you're implying that it doesn't do much more than address a subjective experience of normal vision. And I think that I think that's right, actually. I think to um, that for me is the right way to go after a science of consciousness. We want to understand like what what is distinct what is distinct about particular kinds of perceptual experience. Why do they have the character they do? Why is vision different from audition, different from emotion? And if we can come up with a language that links mechanism to these differences in the way these experiences manifest, that for me is enough. The, the first way of putting it, how does it address qualia, subjective experience? I worry that there's a slip there towards like, you wanna know why there is anything it is like to be having that experience. It's trying to address the more hard problem rather than real problem aspects. So I guess what I would, I mean, what I, what I forgot to say in the talk is, I mean, the real hope of all this is that once you account for subjective properties, in terms of mechanism. You keep on doing that in progressively more sophisticated ways. You might get to a, a, a point where there, there just doesn't seem to be a hard problem anymore. Like, right. The hard problem rather than being solved is, is just dissolved. <laughs> That's a good way to get rid of it. Um, second question I go with, uh, second most upvoted question by the audience is a question by um, Ida Mamlajad. Uh, how can we measure consciousness in non-human animals um, and machines? Yeah, this is a brilliant question, and but of course, there's no, there's really no good answer, uh, no definitive answer to that, um, because to really do that, you need a, a kind of consensus about what's sufficient for consciousness, um, independent of where it might uh, appear. Uh, Sorry, presumably some of these um, limitations also um, are are also valid for even looking at consciousness in humans. I presume. Absolutely. So you know, in in humans, for instance, we face this this problem all the time in, in, in deciding whether, for instance, somebody who suffered brain injury and is in a diagnosis as being in a vegetative state or, or in a emerging from coma, you know, are, they, are they conscious even if they can't behave? 
Now, you know, I think one of the real successes of consciousness science over the last 20 years has been the development of methods to diagnose residual awareness in human patients. And this isn't really based on the approach that I've been talking about today, but it's, it's sort of based on, on, on measuring things like the dynamic complexity of brain activity in humans. And you can, you, know, you can use that to come up with a measure. This is work by people like Giulio Tononi and Marcello Massimini uh, that come up with a number um, for indicative of whether a person is conscious. Now, how do you generalize that to animals and machines? That's really difficult. With animals, you know, I think you do it sort of incrementally, step by step. You know, we, it's always an inference. It's always a best guess. We, we know, as we know more about what's uh, implicated in consciousness in humans, we can look at whether there are analogs or homologs in other animals. And we already kind of know that the stuff is there in mammals, but it gets trickier with fish and with insects, and possibly with birds. With machines, it's really, really hard. You know, you get a number, you can you know, measure the complexity of, acti of, of activity in a neural network. Seems to be no good reason to interpret that as indicative of consciousness because this, this big open question is still there about um, whether it's substrate dependent or not. Right. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one because there are so many questions. I'd like to go through some of them at least. So third question is by uh, Shahab Bakhtiari. And he's asking, can you elaborate a little bit more on the difference between the top-down prediction and subjective feeling, uh, feeling of consciousness in the predictive coding framework that you presented? Okay, let me think how to, um, how to understand that. Oops, it's just gone. I needed to read that one because it's complicated. Um, so, so yeah, so, so there's this sort of the difference between... Well, I'm, I'm rather thinking of, of these predictions in this predictive processing framework as uh, a way of articulating the, you know, a mapping between mechanism and phenomenology. I think this is, I, I feel like I'm saying the same thing, but maybe from slightly different angles all, all the times. But predictions in a predictive processing framework can have many different kinds of character. They, they can be and, and they can differ, for instance, in terms of the predictions about the consequences of actions. So a good example is if I have a, a cup, you know, visually, I am perceiving the back of the cup, even though I'm not directly, it's not directly available to my eyes. And this is the phenomenological property of objecthood. People like Alvin Noe and Kevin O'Regan have talked about this a lot. Um, I can understand that in a predictive coding sense in that my brain is making predictions about conditional predictions about the sensory consequences of actions. And when it, when it has a set of conditional predictions of that sort, I experience objected. But when I experience an emotion, for instance, that's not about the, the consequences of rotating my liver inside my body, right? I, I'll experience a different kind, there'll be different kinds of conditional predictions about the consequences of actions for my basic physiological integrity. So things feel good or bad rather than solid or, or flat. So different kinds of predictions underpin different kinds of subjective experiences. And that's what I think the richness of this, where the richness of this framework lies. Makes a lot of sense. I, I, I would love to go through more questions, but we're already four minutes after, uh, uh, after the time. So um, I think what we'll do, and also I don't want to be attacked by a panda myself. I need to stay sick on time. So um, I'm going to ask the audience to join me again in thanking Anil and stick around because Anil is going to be back and we'll take more questions with him in the panel discussion later. I see there are so many questions, so I'll go through them also uh, to make sure we cover. Thank you. But you'll be able to save the questions, will you? I'd love to see them kind of, even yeah, if it's offline. Yeah. I'd love Absolutely. to have a look through. Everything's going to be saved. Everything's going to